If you're thinking about saving money this summer, why not start by paying less interest on your credit card balances? Refinance with the credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. It's an easy way to save hundreds of thousands of dollars and lower your interest rate. You could get your funds as soon as the day you apply. Lightstream believes that people with good credit deserve a great interest rate and no fees. So say goodbye to high interest credit cards this summer and start saving with Lightstream. My listeners can save even more with an additional interest rate discount on top of Lightstream's already low rates. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash smith. That's lightstream, L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash smith, S-M-I-T-H. Subject to credit approval, rate includes 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com for more information. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. Up, what is up, America? You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show at ESPN Radio and ESPN News. No, clearly this is not Stephen A. Michael E's in the building for Stephen A. today, taking you up to 3 o'clock Eastern. That's noon out on the West Coast. we got a lot to get to over the next two hours because typically most people don't like Mondays, right? Yesterday's Monday, though, was kind of cool because it had a lot of good stuff, but also had a lot of stuff for us to talk about and dissect on a Tuesday. We're going to do that over the next two hours with your help, of course. one eight 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 say espn That's one eight 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 seven two nine three seven seven six. Coming up over the next couple of hours, ESPN insider Adam Sheft is going to join us. Going to talk about Andrew Luck, what we saw from him last night, the Ravens quarterback situation while they may be in maybe the best situation of maybe any team in the NFL as it relates to the depth of the quarterback position. Also, what's up with Aaron Donald? How come everybody in the Rams can get paid, but he can't get paid? Adam Schefter is going to give us a little bit of that. Also, speaking of Andrew Luck, Colts reporter Mike Wells is also going to join us from Indianapolis. Go a little deeper into just the saga that has been Andrew Luck's comeback from that soldier, that shoulder injury. It's been nearly two years since he's played in a real meaningful game. Now, granted, come back from surgery, preseason game was probably meaningful to him, but it's been a long time. We saw some of the rust last night, but we're going to go a little deeper into the overall Colts plan for Andrew Luck here in 2018. Matt Berry, sports and anchor, fellow sports and anchor, is going to join me a little bit later as well. He's handling duties right now. Um, I've got the 11 o'clock Sports Center later tonight, so we're both tag teaming here, but he's going to be back with us a little bit later. Also, Tiger Woods spoke this morning. Going to hear from him. Of course, you got the FedEx Cup starting this week. Three straight weeks of tournaments. Tiger going to play all three. And what would it mean for him to win the FedEx Cup? Would it be as big or maybe even bigger if he had won one of the four majors this year? We will dissect that. All kind of goodies coming up here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Uh, time for Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. All right, last night's Monday Night Football game, between the Ravens and the Colts, you had two storylines running parallel as it related to the quarterback position, right? Joe Flacco is clearly the starter in Baltimore, as he has been over the last several years. Of course, he won a Super Bowl a few years ago as well. But he was not just good last night. He was really impressive, going 7 of 9, throwing an array of passes, hitting players in different parts of the field, even trying to go deep at times with the one touchdown. If he's playing that well, and he has the offensive weapons around him, how good are the Ravens going to be? We talk about the Patriots, of course. The Steelers maybe should have been a little bit better last year in the playoffs. we got the great defense down in Jacksonville. You look around the league, like, all right, the AFC is kind of still the Patriots, right? But is it, though? If the Ravens still play the defense they played for so many years, can then be aided with an offense that we sort of got teased with last night, should we be looking at them more seriously in the AFC? Have they been overlooked coming into this season as a serious contender in the AFC? Is it about the division? Or is it simply about them being able to score enough points? Now, since Joe Flacco led them to the Super Bowl a couple years ago and he got the big contract, no one's made more money, I believe, in the NFL the last few seasons than Joe Flacco, hadn't really had the production that the contract would suggest, right? But is this the payoff? Is 2018 the year that Flacco is going to be a guy that can go out and win you a second Super Bowl because of all the things around him? 
I was talking to Lewis Riddick last night on SportsCenter, and he said the thing that stands out to him about what he's seen from Baltimore is the array of weapons that they have at Joe Flacco's disposal. And with an arm like Joe Flacco, the consistency of Joe Flacco, the even-killedness of Joe Flacco, he believes that he is poised for a big year. He didn't say MVP year, but he said big year. But if Joe Flacco leads the Ravens to maybe the best record in the AFC, oh, yeah, he's going to win the MVP. There's no question about that. But are we overlooking them because we've been looking at the Patriots for so long? I mean, Joe Flacco was beyond solid last night, throwing just two incompletions. Is he the guy that's going to make all the difference? So that was one storyline. The other storyline, other side of the field, of course, was Andrew Luck. I mentioned the fact it's been nearly two years since he's played in a game that really mattered. And last night, a little rusty. At times, got picked off. Um, But what is the future for Andrew Luck? Do we know? Are we too far ahead of ourselves because he's back and we think that he's supposed to be who he is as opposed to a guy who hasn't played in nearly two years? As promised, Matt Berry, Sports Center anchor extraordinaire, has joined us in the studio. And I know you were watching the game last night. Yeah. Um, were you more concerned about what you saw from the Ravens with Joe Flacco, maybe Lamar Jackson, RG3, or with Andrew Luck and if he's going to be prepared for this season. You know, it's funny because we look at, at both of these quarterback situations. We, we we take the Colts and we say, okay, we're excited to see Andrew Luck back. Mm-hmm. But what did we get out of last night? Didn't complete too many deep balls. Uh, they tried to get him into a little bit of a rhythm. And I'll, and I'll say this. We ran the bite on SportsCenter earlier today about how Flacco was so excited to get hit by Terrell Luck. Suggs. Yeah. I'm sorry, Luck. My, mm-hmm. my, yeah. So Luck was so excited to get hit by Terrell Suggs and that, for me, is all I needed to hear. Because mm. if you look at the hit, yeah. it was on the throwing arm. Mm-hmm. His arm was stopped in motion, and he was hit pretty hard. Yes. And so and, and driven into the ground, too. Driven into the ground right. by Suggs. No flag. I'm shocked there was no flag. Uh, but I like him to come back, and I like him to find his rhythm. Joe Flacco, to me, is a player that the Ravens, if you look what they did, bring it in Crabtree. John Brown, mm-hmm. they drafted the first-year kid out of South Carolina, the tight end Hayden Hurst. They're loaded. He's got zero excuses. Right. There's none. No excuses. It's, it's done for him. This is this is it. He's got to win. And that's key because over a couple years past, you're like, oh, he didn't have this, didn't have this, right. someone got hurt, blah, 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 blah. Well, they don't have that anymore. If what we saw last night in terms of an array of weapons, not just one guy that's going to stretch the field for you every time or one guy you know that's going to make the catch for you every single time you throw it to him, they have all those things. Give me a team. I mean, let's think about this for a second. In the AFC, Patriots don't have that. Nope. They've got Gronk, who's aging. They've got Edelman, who's out for the first four games. Mm-hmm. Who's after that? No. Decker. You're going to give me Decker? Look at every team in the AFC. And this sounds funny, but the only other team that you could perhaps say, Oh, look at those weapons outside. The Cleveland Browns. You're going there right now? Look at who they have. They've got Landry. Josh Gordon's back. Yeah. I'm all in on the rookie. Callaway out of Florida. Okay. Partly because I'm really into hard knocks right now, so I've got that. <laughs> and Joku. Okay. When healthy and catching the football, they bring over Carlos Hyde. Bradley, Ch- or not Bradley Chubb, Nick Chubb. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a damn good offense. They have a lot of potential there. I would say maybe the Steelers have the best array of offensive yeah, weapons yep. that we know can go out there and get it done. That we do know. But Flacco, like you said, Matt, he has no excuses now. I'm not saying they have to win the Super Bowl. I'm not trying to put them on that like that. But if they're not absolutely head and shoulders above everyone in that division, I should say head and shoulders. If they're not contending up until the last two weeks of the season for that division crown, that is a failure. And that John, is a failure. And you're right, because John Fox said it earlier with us that he was a he was a he's won a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why we get into this. We love the is he elite or not. I mean, the guy won a Super Bowl and he was a huge reason why. Mm-hmm. He hasn't had much to deal with. No. And he has the talent. They've got a decent offensive line. And you have to look at it if you're a player. If they draft someone at your position and move up to get said person at your position. That's a wake up call. Yeah, that's a flag that says, you know what? I mean, the Giants did it with Eli Manning. They, Davis Webb wasn't the answer, but they were vocally looking for a quarterback. Yeah, and you almost know it's your time. And so, I look at last night's game. 
with what we see, the return of Andrew Luck and the last chance for Joe Flacco, if I'm banking on one of these two guys to lead my team to the next level, I think you go Andrew Luck, but I'm not going to be surprised if Joe Flacco is a hell of a year. What about the backup situation there in oh. Baltimore? Um, Lamar Jackson, he, 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 he gave you what you would think a typical rookie quarterback draft in the first round would give you. He would show you the flashes of why you drafted him in the yep. first place, moved up to draft him. And then he also showed you that he is still a rookie and he was a guy that took the ball and the shotgun pretty much his entire career at Louisville. And he's going to make some mistakes clearly as he adjusts to the NFL game. But I'm, I'm looking at him out there. And I, I see the progression. It's rough, but it's smoother than it was the week before. And I see a future in him that I'm not saying he's going to change the game, but he could be really good as the game evolves itself. There's no question. Here's where it is with Lamar Jackson. I'm going to get killed for saying this. Uh oh. Right now, mm-hmm. RG3 is a better quarterback. True. Lamar Jackson's a better football player. Mm. And if I'm the Ravens, it would, I mean, you would. I, I think you have to keep three quarterbacks. Yeah. Because I don't know that if Joe Flacco goes down that you can go to the playoffs with Lamar Jackson. I do think you could probably get there with RG3. He's been there. He knows the league. But I do think Lamar Jackson's a more dangerous football player. Yeah. And there has to be a way to get this athlete right now, because he's not an NFL quarterback yet. But he's a really, really, really dangerous athlete. Yeah. Find a way to get him involved. Give him two series a game and just run a, a Lamar Jackson package. Because I still think above any other quarterback that came into the draft, he presents the biggest problem for the ability to defend him. Yes. The other guys, Josh Rosen's the best pure passer. Sam Darnold's probably got the best upside. Josh Allen, from all indications, a physical freak. And Baker Mayfield's posing shirtless with Tigers. Which, again, <laughs> I, you know, I do think eventually he's going to be good. But Lamar Jackson, for me, he makes you gasp when you watch him play football. Yes. He hasn't gotten the quarterback thing down yet, and I'm fine with that. Because it's going to take time. But for him, get him on the field somehow, some way, because he's too good of a football player. I mean, last night we we saw the full arsenal in terms of, of, of the good aspect of Lamar Jackson. There was a run out to the right, yep. avoided pressure, got the first down, got out of bounds. And then there was another play similar, ran that way, but he saw the receiver running across the field for the back of the end zone, and he throws a, a gun into a tight window for a touchdown. He's like, yes, that's what we have from him. It's all about refining the other aspects of it. Um, and getting him ready to go. You, now you have RG3, who's just trying to find himself back in the league again. That's right. Um, but there's value for the Ravens you have all three because, as you said, you want to have Lamar Jackson on the field in, in some capacity a couple times a game. And then you have RG3, who's more than capable, you would believe at this point, to be a good backup. The question is, as it relates to the other quarterbacks around the league, too, mm-hmm. Sam Darnold, Teddy Bridgewater. Teddy Bridgewater's played pretty well in the pro season. He, in, the, in the preseason, he has a history of being a starting quarterback. Sam Darnold's your future. Do you put him out there right away? Some suggest yes. But now if you're the Jets, if you got Sam Darnold out there, do you use Teddy Bridgewater to go get you something you really need? Yes. You trade Bridgewater immediately. You've got Josh no McCown. Question. No question. You okay. trade him right now because here's what you have to ask yourself. Because we were talking about it earlier about all these quarterback situations around the league where what's the option if you're a team – that's not really a playoff team. Let's use the Jets for an example. Mm-hmm. Are the Jets a playoff team with Teddy Bridgewater? I don't think so. And that's not an indictment on Bridgewater. I think a lot of quarterbacks could be the starter for the Jets and they still not be a playoff contender. So if that's the case, then if Bridgewater is not the difference between the playoffs or not, use the equity to be better. Equity to get better. Mm-hmm. Start Sam Darnold. He's your future of the franchise anyway. Get some equity. Josh McCown's a guy that's there. He's been in the league. He can get it done. Then you look at a team like the Ravens, what I just said a second ago. If RG3 shows himself enough, Mm -hmm. is there equity with this guy to go trade him? The Arizona Cardinals have Sam or have uh, Sam Bradford. They have Josh Rosen. They have Mike Glennon. I mean, there are opportunities around the league to where if you need to, Cleveland Browns, Drew Stanton, Baker Mayfield, Tyrod Taylor. Tyrod. I'm sorry, Tarod. <laughs> Tarod 2.0. Yeah, don't get don't get it twisted. So there are n- numerous organizations that have this weird situation where the third teamer is going to be a guy who started in the league at some point. 
And if you're the Jets and you know that there are teams starving for a quarterback, Teddy Bridgewater is a starting quarterback in the NFL. Yes. Go get something for yes. him. And there, there's a report from the New York Daily News that the Jets have contacted the Jaguars about Dante Fowler Jr. because they need help on that side of the mm. ball. So if you can go move a Teddy Bridgewater for a Fowler, maybe that's a win-win for both teams. But as it relates to the Ravens, though, worst case scenario, Joe Flacco gets hurt. Yep. Do you want RG3 starting or do you want Lamar Jackson? You want RG3. All right, then. So No question. So then he's your security blanket for Joe Flacco. You're going to have Lamar Jackson out there for an option during games to do something kind of funky, but if something happens and Flacco gets hurt and you have to have someone start a game, you're probably going to be more comfortable with RG3 doing it early on than you are Lamar Jackson. You know who I would if I were a front office whiz and I could make a couple of deals? Mm -hmm. I'd call the Patriots for Teddy Bridgewater. Really? I'd call the Patriots. Who's backing up Tom Brady? Homeboy, what, what's his name? I don't even know. Is that bad? Probably. Okay. For the Patriots. He chased it. Brady chased out all the other good players. Yeah. And Garoppolo and Brissett. Oh, yeah, Brian Hoyer. Hoyer's your guy. So Hoyer's your backup. Call the Patriots. Call Bill Belichick. Be like, you know what? Bridgewater's going to be a guy. He knows he's smart. He can come in. He can learn the offense. Brian Hoyer's your backup quarterback. You don't really have a good situation behind Brady. You dealt all your assets that were going to be your future. Mm -hmm. Give them a call. I mean, it's in a, in a division. I don't know if they want to do that. Right. But I think that's a good fit. You've got to go to a system where you're pretty set, but there is a risk of injury. And Tom Brady's age, he's getting up there. They don't have a good solution. Maybe that's the guy. You listen to the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN2 today. Michael Leaves along with Matt Barry. 188-SAY-ESPN, 188-729-3776. You know, you, you come off a game last night and you had all these quarterback storylines, and I've been intrigued by a lot of storylines going into this NFL season. A lot of them do have to do with the quarterback position because, you know, they're A1A uh, in the league. But what's another storyline, Matt, that has your attention that maybe not enough people are paying attention to in terms of how – it could affect the overall outcome of the 2018 season. I have one for you. I got a couple of them. One, look at Denver. And this isn't going to be a big storyline until something happens. Let's just say Case Keenum comes out there and struggles. Mm -hmm. People love Chad Kelly. He's a Mr. Irrelevant. Could he be the first Mr. Irrelevant to start a quarterback in the National League? Staying in Denver. Royce Freeman, the rookie running back out of Oregon. There are so many pockets in the NFL where you can find – a couple of players that can come in right away and succeed. Mm -hmm. Rookies are going to be the show. Saquon Barkley is going to come in immediately, and I've said this a hundred times. If the offensive line can stay healthy and Eli can complete a pass, you're looking at Evan Ingram, Odell Beckham, Saquon Barkley. Those are three really, really good skill position players. So rookies, more so than we've seen in the past, have the opportunity to come into an organization and lead that team quickly to better heights than we've seen that team get to before. I'm looking at two teams in particular. You know, oftentimes in sports, regardless of the respective sport, we say that teams have to learn how to win. Yep. But then sometimes we see teams jump that learning curve a little bit and get to a point that no one expected them to be that early. There were two teams that did that last year, the Rams yeah. and the Jaguars. All right. Their defense in Jacksonville was so good that they were threatening the Patriots in the AFC to go to the Super Bowl. Think about that for a second, right? And then the Rams just moved, got a new stadium, got a young quarterback, got young players. All of a sudden, boom, young like, wait coach. a minute. Young head coach, right? All of a sudden, like, wait, this team's one of the more dynamic teams in the league. I want to see how those two teams respond to expectations. They didn't have those last year. Even um, when they were doing well, like, oh, this is great, but it's not going to really last, da-da-da. And granted, the Rams lost a round in the playoffs earlier than a lot of people expected to, but they were there to begin with mm -hmm. where no one thought they would be there. Same thing probably for the Jags. How are the Rams going to respond to the spotlight considering the moves they made? All things considered, based on how they played last year and the players they added this year, and this is under the premise that they will get Aaron Donald back in the fold and him be ready for the season. Yep. How can you not look at them as maybe the favorite? You can't. How many people know Endomican Sue plays football out there? Right. How many people know that? I mean, and that's a good point. You bring that up because 
every year there's that team that takes advantage of a last place schedule prior to the result the year mm-hmm. before, and they win a lot of football games. But if I'm looking across football right now, Minnesota was kind of that way. Yes. They were another team that you're like, you know, who's your court? Uh, okay, you know. But he's gone now. you got a new quarterback there. So it's like I, I'm giving them the a pass Bills a little bit. were another one. Yeah. Terod Taylor, what were they, 8-8, eight and eight, and they made the postseason the last day of the season. But you're right, because now we all love the Rams. Yes. Best team in the league. They're in L.A. They got all the flashy players on the squad. Todd Gurley, Jared Goff. You got Marcus Peters and Aqib Tlaib in your, back, in your secondary now. Brandon Cooks. Come on, man. I mean, they're loaded. Dude, if they don't win, it will be a huge – let me say, if they don't go to the Super Bowl. Ooh. If they don't go to the Super Bowl – they're going to look at their season as a failure. They, and they should. And they should. Brad, if the Eagles just won the Super Bowl, you think, well, we got the Eagles and Carson Wentz coming back. He's coming back off injury. Slow your roll. Slow your roll there. Who's this year's Rams? Mm. That's a tease. I think that's a tease. It should be. I, I think we'll just look, tease. I, there's, it, <laughs> yeah, I there, too, there, give me one. There's an answer out there. I mean, there's an answer out there. I'm gonna look. We'll, we'll we'll get back to that. Give us a call, by the way. Who is this year's Rams? I like that one. Eight 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 say ESPN. So up next, we got Adam Schefter. We got Mike Wells from the Colts coming up around two thirty. Uh, plenty more Stephen A. Smith show coming up. Hey, do you have frequent heartburn like the kind where you have an acid stash everywhere in case it pops up? You know what I mean. You keep some in your bag or your desk or your car, or even your nightstand. You have those chalky tablets ready for whenever and wherever heartburn strikes. Well, listen up. There's an easier way to deal with your heartburn. Prilosec OTC. Just one pill a day will last a full 24 hours with zero heartburn. Kick your antacid habit. It's possible with Prilosec OTC. Use as directed for 14 days to treat frequent heartburn, not for immediate relief. Michael Lees, Matt Berry, back with you. Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN2. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to GEICO. I should have done this years ago. Disclaimer, traveling back in time is physically impossible unless you know how to build a functioning time machine. Then by all means, travel 25 years back in time, switch your car insurance to GEICO. You could save a bunch of money. While you're there, please prevent your younger self from wearing that sleeveless tuxedo t-shirt, parachute pants, and glitter high tops to your senior prom. And at long last, rectify this horrible crime against nature. GEICO is absolved of all liability if you destroy the fabric of time and space. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. When a player doesn't like a contract, they hold out, right? Well, with Straight Talk Wireless, you never have to because there is no contract. And they use the same 4G LTE towers as the big carries, but for a lot less. Straight Talk Wireless, only at Walmart. Refer to terms and conditions of service at straighttalk.com. Michael Lee's back here. And uh, Adam Schefter has so much information. Way to kick Matt Berry out of the studio. <laughs> um, let's start with last night's game because a couple of storylines to me stood out. Clearly the return of... Andrew Luck and Lou Riddick told me last night on Sports Center that he's noticed that Luck is not really throwing the ball down the field yeah. like you know with a lot of velocity going 30 yards down the field from the people you've talked to Adam is that all part of the plan because they've been so cautious yeah. with him over the last year and a half well there were no throws over 20 yards none now the throws that he did make he looked sharp and accurate on That's true. there's no dispute in that and I think that part of this is the fact that um there was no TY Hilton to stretch the field. And if there's no T.Y. Hilton, then you're not going to throw some of those deep balls that you ordinarily would. New offensive coordinator, Nick Sirianni, getting used to some things. Mm -hmm. And it could just be that they don't want to show any defense anything because why would you do that in the preseason when defenses will be wondering on opening day if he can do it. If he can do it or not. And maybe they won't believe that he can and maybe he's going to unleash 160 yards to T.Y. Hilton for a touchdown on opening day that's going to lead the Colts to a victory. So you just don't know whether he can or he can't, I think it's a question. I think it's a valid question. Yeah, until you see it, you don't know. That's right. And he didn't make any throws over 20 yards. But the throws he did make, they looked very strong. He looked like Andrew Luck, for whatever that's worth. Yeah. We want to see him look like Andrew Luck with some of these long throws as well. Yeah, because his value to the offense is unmistakable. And that's why a lot of people are wondering if he is still that guy or does he have some time left to add a little more strength to the arm. Let's go to the other side for a second. Joe Flacco looked really good, no issues there. But interesting in terms of the backup situation with Lamar Jackson and Robert Griffin III, both looked very impressive in their time on the field last night. Are the Ravens holding on to these guys, putting them out there, and plan to maybe try to make a deal for one of these with another team? I don't think that's what it is. Look, Lamar Jackson's not going anywhere. He's going to be probably the number 2 quarterback. 
And I think that there is definitely strong consideration being given to keep an RG3 mm-hmm. as the number three quarterback. Because on game day, you're only going to have the two quarterbacks active. And Lamar Jackson's going to be active because he's going to be a part of third down packages, right. red zone plays, whatever it may be that they think he can benefit them. And RG3, who didn't play last year, has looked good and has basically played the quarterback position better than Lamar Jackson. But it's not about playing better than Lamar Jackson in the preseason. It's about what he's going to do over the course of a regular season. And Lamar Jackson's completing 42% of his passes in the preseason. But again, that's something that he'll learn over time. He'll get better. He'll improve. And they'll use him right now as the weapon that he is to be effective in certain spots and provide that Ravens offense with a boost. And I think, in a way, Lamar Jackson's already done that with Joe Flacco because Joe Flacco's had the best camp of his career because Mm -hmm. he's been pushed by the presence of a a team that went out and invested a first-round draft pick and a quarterback when Joe Flacco's still been there. Could you foresee a team in the near future wanting the services of RG three? Could he could he increase his market back to where he could get onto a team? Well, I that's in a he, position. Let me rephrase: in a position that he's going to be productive and maybe get playing time, not just third string on on a team that's going to go to the playoffs. Look, I think he's trying to just get a roster spot. Okay. It, it, to me, it's one thing at a time, right? If he can just win a roster spot, get his way back into the league, there's enough attrition. There are enough injuries at that position that eventually a chance and an opportunity will come along. And if he does the right things and continues to just improve and grow, uh, he'll get a chance. And when he does, it's time to take advantage of it. But I think his goal right now Mm -hmm. should just be to find a spot on a 53-man roster. If he could do that, that's a major victory for him. ESPN NFL insider Adam Schefter joining us here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Let's go to the other coast. And I saw yesterday that the Rams uh, signed with their offensive lineman to an extension. And I was looking at it, and I, my immediate response was, the Rams seem to be paying everybody but Aaron Donald. Now, granted, this may be all part of a master plan, and this is all the piece of falling into place, and then they're going to handle Donald when they felt they needed to get it done. I don't know if Aaron Donald would view it that way from the outside looking in. From the people you've talked to, what is the response to the Rams signing everybody but Aaron Donald? Well, here's the thing. It's not like they're not trying to sign Aaron right. Donald. But for the price they want, and clearly Don- Donald has a different price. Right, exactly. But it's a situation where, again, they're trying to work it out with Aaron Donald, and they're continuing to try to work it out. And I, uh, my guess would mm-hmm. be, and it's a guess, that they'll get a deal worked out by the start of the regular season at some point in time because both sides have too much to lose and enough at stake that it makes sense for both sides to get it done. And they've been in, as Sean McVay described, ongoing dialogue yeah. and more constant communication. So, to me, I, I, I think that they're... Going to try to work it out. I think they'll get it worked out. Mm-hmm. It's my sense. And even though the Rams are signed Brandon Cooks and Todd Gurley and Rob Havenstein, their right tackle, they've planned for this with Aaron Donald. They've budgeted for it. It's not like they don't have any money left right. where they can't get it. They just have not been able to get it done with the guy. Well, uh, I heard Darren Woodson talk about this recently as well. Maybe the same situation for Khalil Mack. For so long, position players were slotted ranking against themselves and their peers, where quarterbacks were up here, running back market here, it feels as if that maybe someone like a Khalil Mack, Aaron Donald, aren't trying to be the highest paid player at their position, but relative to the importance on their respective teams. And if you look at maybe the most important player on that team, Aaron Donald would rank up there pretty high, but in his mind maybe he doesn't feel like he's paid as if he's that valuable. Well, again, I think it's a situation where he has a big number of minus. He should. He's a dominant defensive player. And the Rams have a number in mind, and they've been offering him more money than any defensive player in history. So they're both being within their rights Mm -hmm. to try to get this worked out. They just haven't been able to do it yet, right now. And again, Cleo Mack also holding out there for the Raiders. You look at his value to the team. Uh, Yeah, a lot of money out there. Someone's going to have to get in at some point if you want to get those guys into your camp. Uh, I can't get you out of here, Adam, without talking about the helmet rule. Yeah. And, you know, Chris Mortensen reported earlier today that. The league says this is going to be maybe a three-year process just to get everyone on the same page with this particular rule. They're going to continue to add up more videos to the coaches, players, Mm -hmm. officials, things of that nature. Here's the sense I get from how this whole thing played out. They had an idea, and it was a good idea. I think everyone who, who watches football believes that preventing injuries, especially to the neck and head area, is a good thing for the game. So you take an idea, then you put it into language, Something gets lost. Then you take that language and try to execute it. Something else gets lost. It's going through like two filters. And now it's at a point where like, this doesn't make any sense. When you try to look back up the timeline, you can see how it kind of got messed up. Mm-hmm. The question is, is the league and the officials 
throwing way more flags in the preseason to sort of speed up that process so guys do get used to it because eventually they do want to get this type of play out of the league. I, I don't know that it's speeding up the process, Michael, so much as it is just sending a message. Bringing more everybody. awareness. This is going to be a deal for us. Well, I, I think that they want to make sure that everybody knows that this is going to be watched closely, that they have an understanding of this. You know, the problem with the preseason so far, I think that there has been a lack of consistency and clarity mm-hmm. from everybody. And I think the league wants players and coaches to know that helmets are not to be used as weapons. They're to be used for protection. And that's the message that the league is trying to get across, that officials are trying to get across. Now, it's being confused some because there has not been consistency and people are in hysteria over yeah. this new rule, which I do think will be eased back and relaxed as the regular season begins. Also keep in mind, we haven't seen a player ejected yet. Can you imagine if and when it comes, and I think it'll happen at some mm-hmm. point, that an offensive player, a dominant running back, is thrown out of the game early in the first quarter because he lowers his head and impacts his team's chances that day. And that's going to be something that every team has to be aware of. But that is part of the league attempting, efforting to change the culture, right. to take the head out of the game, yeah. and for the players to understand that the helmets are not to be used as weapons. They want them used for protection. It's a daunting challenge. It's a huge issue. Not as if the league had enough of them to begin with already. <laughs> but now the league is going to figure out a way to uh, basically work this in and have everybody adjust to the new tackling. And needs. that's the thing. We also self-admittedly overreact to most things in the preseason, good or bad. That's what we do. And it's what we do. But once the season starts and games start mattering, I think if we get to a situation, though, Adam, where let's say one of these plays – happens with 10 seconds to go in a game and it determines the outcome. Or like you said, an offensive player gets ejected. Maybe it's even an offensive lineman going out on a block and gets ejected. Then that hysteria is going to jump back up again, and it would be interesting to see how the league and the players and everyone else responds to it. Yeah, well, again, it's a process, and we'll see how it all unfolds. Everybody's going to be watching when the league kicks off uh, that Thursday night between Atlanta and Philadelphia to see how this is officiated, to see how it's implemented. And again, the idea is right. Mm-hmm. It's the right idea. Okay, you you want to make the game safer. Now the question is how they all execute it. ESPN NFL insider Adam Schefter joins us here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Appreciate it, man. Michael, thank you, my friend. Always good stuff. Hey, it's been a long offseason without football, but FanDuel has spent it getting into the best shape of their lives. That means this. FanDuel is ready for more. More ways to play, more ways to challenge your friends, and most importantly, more ways to win. And FanDuel also has new options for playing daily fantasy with your friends because the only thing better than winning cash is winning your friends' cash. They even have preseason fantasy contests running up to week one of the NFL. Right now, you can get a $20 bonus when you make your first deposit on FanDuel. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash Stephen A. Age and state restrictions apply. More of the Stephen A. Smith Show next. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN The App. We're on ESPN2 today. Michael Leeds along with Matt Berry, your favorite sports center anchors, not named L. Duncan. Uh, Straight Talk Wireless, <laughs> nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE network. Stephen A. Smith Show brought to you by Pennzoil Synthetics, taking synthetic motor oil performance to a whole new level. Make the switch to Pennzoil Synthetics today. Now, for those of you who don't know much about Matt and me personally, we are both golf geeks. Um, and that means we're all in on all things Tiger Woods when he's back on the course. We've got the FedEx Cup starting uh, this week with the Northern Trust. Yep. Of course, Tiger played very well in the Open Championship, had a chance to win on the back nine, had a chance to win the PJ Championship on the back Which nine Which you and I never well. got to talk about the PGA. No, we really didn't. I mean, that was amazing. That, that was great theater. Uh, whether you're a golf fan or not, everyone who was watching it was just enthralled, and people were starting to tune into it because That's he was so there good. and the, the way he was playing, blah, 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 blah. All right, But he didn't get it done. But now he's going to play three straight weeks, according to him. He doesn't have to, but he's going to. Because he got in. He got in. He's trying to win the FedEx Cup championship. It, it, you wheeled out the field every week. Da, da, da. He can still get to the Tour Championship without playing all three weeks, but he's going to play all three weeks. Having said that, if he wins the FedEx Cup, yeah. which would probably require him to win the Tour Championship to get it done, you got to be in a certain number there. If he does that, would that be bigger than if he would have won one of these majors. Would it be more impressive from a golf standpoint that he was able to do that as opposed to winning 
a major. No, because Tiger said from day one, judging by major championships, and if he comes with his back being sewn together and wins a major for number 15, I think that would have been a better story. It would have been a better story, but from a golf achievement, oh, from a, because look where he yeah. was in the golf rankings, where he was in the FedEx Cup rankings, to be able to get there to win okay, it. Okay, so as far as collective body of work for yes. golf, I mean, that would stand a reason because he'd have to be in contention in these next three events. Correct. And if he comes back after being... And it finished six at Carnoustie, second. I mean, yeah, that'd be pretty damn good. Right. But the guy's 175, 175th strokes gained off the tee. Can't hit a fairway to save his no. life. Didn't hit one on the on the front nine of the last round um, at the PJ Championship, but was still two under on that side. Didn't hit a fairway. He was two under on that side. Oh. You know how many golfers in the world can do that? Literally a handful, a handful in that field that week. 0 for 7, fairways, grabs a three-wood on eight. I mean, it's so fun to be able to talk about because I'm one of the I'm a football and golf nerd. Mm-hmm. But at this time of year, when college football gets started, I kind of veer away from golf a little bit when the FedEx Cup starts because I haven't I haven't really been excited about the FedEx Cup. Doesn't do it for you now. Uh oh, we're all in with Tiger. I'm in. You're in. I am all in because now he can compete again, and what he does is he makes other players better. Yes, and we saw this from Brooks Kepka. His tee shot on 17, the PJ Championship, after what Tiger did, Oof. said everything about Brooks Kepka. That's it. And most players in the past would not have done what Brooks Kepka did. But again, he's a different type of dude, and Tiger's a different type of cat. And earlier he, today, he spoke, um, had a very early news conference for it Tiger was weird, Woods. Yeah. It was 9 a.m. Clearly, he had something else scheduled. But this was him talking about the continuing evolution of his golf game this year. Is he still kind of still kind of tinkering on some things? You hear that? I don't hear it. Hard pass. Basically what Tiger yeah, was saying. Yeah, sum it up because you did it on Sports Center. Yeah, Tiger was saying that he's tinkering with shaft, loft, and style for the driver and the two iron because he's trying to figure out what exactly it is he can do to fix himself off the tee. Okay. And it got me to thinking, is this is he really making these changes because he believes it's going to help or mentally – he can go in and say, well, I fixed my shaft on my driver and my two iron. I'm good. Because I don't, look, his swing is his swing is his swing. Mm-hmm. He's going to block him out right when he's trying to do the draw. And when he tries to hit the fade, he overdoes it. And so you're not going to fix the swing. So is, is this him saying, okay, I can fix the shaft. I know that it's fixed. So maybe mentally that'll cleanse him a little. I bit. totally think it's mental. So do I. Because he's so afraid of, of making one particular mistake that he doesn't commit to it and it leads to something else. He doesn't want to hit the, the big hook left, so he blocks it out right. But here's the thing. If you go all the way back to the Hero Challenge last December, yeah. he was hitting the fairway just fine with that driver. Then he changed the shaft. He made changes when he got to the Masters, and he hadn't been the same guy since. But not to get too deep into golf geeky stuff, you probably do that with Maddie and the Caddy podcast with Matt Dro- Berry and uh, Yeah, drops Collins. today. Yeah, new one. Um, his effect on the game and what it will mean for next season is, I don't, I don't even put it into words. That's everything to me. You're 100% right. I am of the belief, contend for the next couple of weeks, he's, he's a lock for the Ryder Cup. Yes, without question. And then go away. Go away, get healthy, because here's what I want. Mm-hmm. I want Tiger on the West Coast swing next year, mm-hmm. rounding into form going into April. This is all well and good. But can you do it? Go away. Because I'm of the belief, when healthy, we get three more years of this Tiger, and then it's over. Three years, that's it. Three years. It'd be 45. 12 more majors. And that, to me, is important. This year, for me, is no longer important. He did what I needed to see him do. Give me the Ryder Cup, and that's it. Were you of the belief prior to this season that he would ever win a major again? Yeah. Okay. I've got that on record in email. All right. Now that you have seen this year... Mm -hmm. How many does he win? I set the over under at one and a half. One and a half is the over under because I I could see him. I think he's always going to be a factor at the Masters till he doesn't play there anymore. Or he's he's old. Yes. So Masters always in contention. Open Championship fits his game. He's never going to compete in U.S. Open again. And the PGA Championship isn't just. I just don't think it's what he does. Okay. He's Give won four a, of it. He's won four at times though. I know, but with where he is in his life, mm-hmm. I think Masters Open Championship, he could probably squeak two of those. Of course, the interesting part about next year is that the P 
PJ Championship is moving up. So you have the Players Championship is mm-hmm. going to move to March. So you got March, April, May, June, July. Five huge events for them, of course, majors with the PA Championship moving up to May instead. Plenty more to come here in the Stephen A. Smith Show coming up in the bottom of the next hour. We've got Mike Wells from the Colts. What's up with Andrew Luck and the plan for him throughout this year? Throwing a deep ball? Not so much. Michael Leaves, Matt Berry, Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN2. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. If you're thinking about saving money this summer, why not start by paying less interest on your credit card balances? Refinance with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. It's an easy way to save hundreds of thousands of dollars and lower your interest rate. You could get your funds as soon as the day you apply. Lightstream believes that people with good credit deserve a great interest rate and no fees. So say goodbye to high interest credit cards this summer and start saving with Lightstream. My listeners can save even more with an additional interest rate discount on top of Lightstream's already low rates. The only way to get this discount is to go to Lightstream.com slash Smith. That's Lightstream, L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash Smith, S-M-I-T-H. Subject to credit approval, rate includes 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit Lightstream.com for more information. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. Michael Lee's Matt Berry filling in for Stephen A. Today on a Tuesday, you can join the conversation at 1-888-SAY-ESPN. That's 1-888-729-3776. Got Mike Wells coming up, 2.30. He's our coach reporter for ESPN. Going to go a little deeper into the Andrew Luck plan here in 2018. Uh, Gentlemen, you've been sitting around for too long, whether you want to get to the game, get in a game, NFL, college football, MLB, or you know what? Maybe it's a concert. Look no further than Vivid Seats, the official ticket partner of ESPN. Go to vividseats.com and enter promo code ESPN to get 10% off your order. Speaking of events, you know I'm a big Prince fan, right? A huge Prince fan. So, Questlove Mm -hmm. from The Roots, Mm -hmm. huge Prince fan. He put together this tour of symphony tribute to Prince. I think they call it For You, a symphonic tribute to Prince. Yeah. So it's coming to Springfield, which is not far from where we live here uh, in central Connecticut, and it's basically a, b- a huge orchestra is going to be playing Prince music all really? night. Yeah. So did I got you to buy your tickets? I did bought the tickets. Uh, wife and I are going to go. Did you use who you just promoted? I did not use Vivid Seats. Mm. I got it from someone else. That would have been the time to segue into the fact that, in fact, I used Vivid Seats for I just this. thought about going to a concert. Uh, hey, we were talking about Tiger Woods earlier. Uh, yes. You can watch Tiger in the first round of the Northern Trust on ESPN Plus Thursday and Friday. He's part of the featured group, 7.54 a.m., going off on the backside with Mark Leishman and Tommy Fleetwood. And then another featured group we have going off, Dustin Johnson, Justin Thomas, Brooks Kepka. That's a group? Uh, really? That's not bad. That's pretty good. Uh, so that's all coming up Thursday, Friday, ESPN Plus, Tiger Woods and company teeing off in the first round of the FedEx Cup playoffs. Uh can I ask you a college football question? Yes, I'd love to answer it. Um, do you hate preseason rankings? Yes. Okay. Do we need them? Yes. So, what do we really complain about here? All right. All From right. television standpoint, I know we need them. But I I hate them because whether anyone will admit to it or not, the preseason rankings – affect the final they rankings. They absolutely do. Because there's, where you start has a lot to do with where you finish. There's no question. That's why I hate them. What we I've see them. in the preseason, I don't like them because I feel that they attach unnecessary expectations to teams that might not be ready yet. And here's the other thing. Like, we're going to be able to sell, i have to look at it again, but off memory, I think Miami's eight, mm-hmm. and they have a big opening week game. Um, you have Notre Dame and Michigan. I think that's twelve and fourteen. I got to like that, yeah. pull the rankings up. But and you've got Auburn and Washington. That's six versus nine. Like that's what you do. You pump the rankings because you pump the hype into these games. But at that point, are we hyping the schools more than anything? Like if you're telling me that Auburn from the SEC is playing Washington from the Pac-12 Week One. I'm in. 
or is it because I'm too close to it and I know how good the teams are? You, know how good you the think teams the other are. fans oh, need to know, yeah. oh, this is first week, we got a top 10 matchup between these two teams. You That's see six me. versus nine, you're in. Okay. And here's the other thing, too. Regardless of the rankings, I think Auburn's going to just do filthy things to Washington. Ooh. I don't think it's going to be close. And Washington, by the ranking, is better. But rankings are a necessary evil to set the leaderboard, essentially, mm-hmm. going into the season based on what we know teams did last year and what they've got coming back. Personally, I think Claps is the best team in the country. Okay, number, I think they're the number one team in the country. But you set the agenda, and then you let the chips fall where they may. There's a team in there. I don't think LSU is a top 25 team. I just don't. Mm-hmm. I think West Virginia is perhaps ranked a little too low. I think Mississippi State's ranked a little bit too low. One reason I hate them because you point out a couple teams there that maybe shouldn't be in there or they're too low, too high. The issue is it's lazy. And I don't care what the voters would tell you in these polls. They don't do the homework that is necessary to really have a more accurate depiction of who are the top 25 teams in the country. Most of it has to do with history, tradition, name recognition. They're going to put Notre Dame in the top 25 every single year, no matter what they do. That's just what's going to happen. Alabama's going to be probably in the top five every year. Every year. If they just continue on the Nick Saban train here. And that's what bothers me about, I don't mean those schools are special. I'm just using those as examples. But let me see who you are, as as opposed to someone trying to tell me who you are, who didn't go to the practices, weren't at spring practice, didn't talk to the coaches, didn't talk to the players, don't know what the depth chart is. They're just going off of some things they read or maybe what they believe. Yeah, but conversely, here's another argument that I've had for a while, and I say this working at ESPN. I don't know that we need the playoff rankings so far out, but we do because it's riveting television. It's yes. really, really good television. So wait, you would want them later? Oh, yeah. Like I how would, late? Final week. The final week. Why do I need to know? Because it's been proven year one of the playoff, it was proven that what you are in week, the week before the end of the season has no bearing on where you end up because TCU came out ranked third in the week before the final rankings. Yep. So if I'm a TCU fan, I'm in, mm-hmm. right? We're in the playoff because we played Iowa State mm-hmm. the final week of the season. You were going to mop up Iowa State. So then all of a sudden, they go from the top, the third best team in the country to out. But that's what it does. The one thing college football has always done, pre-BCS, in the BCS, now in the playoff era, regardless of any sport, I don't care what sport you bring to me, if you call us 8 at ACSPN. There's no better argument than in college football. College football is the one sport that's left that you can argue and debate week in and week out. Can't do it in the NBA. You can't do it in the NFL. You can't do it. You can't do it in any other sport. But football, college football has always allowed that, and a large part of that is because of the rankings. Now, granted, I went to an SEC school in Kentucky, but we weren't a big football program. Matt went to a Pac-12 school, Arizona State, and they had a pretty good run there a while back. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people say, oh, you're coming at it from some bias because you went to SEC schools, things of that nature. No, it's not not that at all. I, I appreciate the quality of the SEC, and I look at other conferences, but I do believe the SEC gets too much credit sometimes early in the season because you don't know who's going to be good. You don't know when Georgia's going to come back and be the team that they were last year. You don't know when Auburn's going to fall off like they did a couple years ago. Or LSU's not the team they're supposed to be just because they have a loud, engaging, personality-filled coach in Ed Ogeron. Yeah, I think also, a lot of that affects it, and that's what bothers me about the poll. They're also having players-only meetings before the season starts as LSU. That would be a problem, right? Let's uh, head out to the phones. Have you gone to the phones yet today? We have not. Oh, First let's time. talk to the people. Uh-oh. Kenny Kenny in Cincinnati wants to talk college football rankings, which is why we're going to Kenny. Hello, Kenny. Hey, guys. How you doing? Good. What's up, man? Hey, I'm just biased about little things. You got Alabama number one. Okay, given the talent that's been coming through there, but I see Clemson as a clear-cut favorite as number one. And also, the running back situation, there's a kid out of Iowa State named David Montgomery. What do you rank him at? Well, look, he's gotten a lot of uh, attention from pro scouts in terms of what he's going to be at the next level going forward. The problem is he plays at Iowa State. All right, so if you're talking about the Heisman situation – what he would have to do at that school to get the amount of attention to require him to win the Heisman, uh, it would sort of have to be what Robert uh, Griffin III That's did exactly at Baylor. Like he's he got to do just above and beyond what would be acceptable of any other Power Five conference. I wouldn't say that, but like like Ohio State or an Alabama or somewhere like that. He'd have to do more than them to get the attention because of the school in which he plays. And they'll have to pick off a team or two in the Big Twelve, and I suppose. Yes, to. like he would have to have like a huge game and they upset. Um, 
Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah, they'd, they'd have, have to, to do something like Oklahoma that. Oklahoma or TCU, and that's the you know. I'll tell you this though, Matt Campbell, yeah, the head coach, he's out. He's gone. He's going to go to a bigger program. Yeah, and that's one of the things I know Iowa State fans hate talking about this, but when you have one of these young up and coming coaches mm-hmm. with the way the coaching carousel works in college football, you you're there, you make your mark, and you bail. Yeah, how many coaching changes? I think we saw twenty one coaching changes this off season. And so, six in the SEC. Hey, that's when when six. you're paying these dudes this much money, you expect immediate results. And if you don't get them, you got to move on to try to get them because the alumni is clamoring for it. You paid all the money for it. Uh, so he agrees with you that Clemson should be the number one team. Or, or let's let's rephrase that: that Clemson is the best team in the country. No question. What you believe? Yeah. But having Alabama just won the national championship. Bringing back both of those quarterbacks, one who got him there, one who won the game. Mm-hmm. Although you don't know who the start is going to be yet, at least not officially. It'd be hard not to put Alabama number one. Oh, you, you mean you're not going to lose an argument putting them number one, right? I mean, they had 12 guys go to the NFL. They have some issues now. They lost one of their starting, I think, their offensive guard, their right guard. They've lost two linebackers. I, Auburn's. I mean, look, you're not going to sit here if, if if Alabama's not number one. You're not going to lose any arguments. But could you make the argument that they're not, they're not the best team in the SEC? Is it Georgia? No, it's not Georgia. It's not Georgia. It's not Georgia. It's not Georgia. As good as they were last year. Not Georgia. And they got the same quarterback coming back. Same and they quarterback. got a, another quarterback behind him Justin that may be Field, better than him. So good. They're still not better than Alabama, who just lost all the talent that you just listed. Yeah. You can't make that argument. No, you lose Roquan Smith, the linebacker. You lose Sony Michelle and Nick Chubb. How much of Jake Fromm's development was based on those two running backs? I think if you're looking at second best team in the SEC, it's Auburn. Auburn's. Mm. Loaded. I'm mm. telling you, save this clip Uh-oh. for the rest of the year. Lock it down. I Auburn with what they're going to do to Washington in Week yeah. One. Okay, they're gonna you're gonna find them in the conversation top five right after Week One. And the other team that had best start getting respect, mm-hmm. and I know they're ranked fourth, and people might laugh at this, but I still don't think anybody's talking about Wisconsin. Yeah, I think Wisconsin wins that league. Okay, let me ask you this. Right. Where is Michigan ranked? Michigan, I think, is the second and a half best team in the Big Ten. All right, in the preseason, I mean, they're ranked 14. Yeah, I think they're better than Michigan State. Overrated. Can I say that? Ooh. I just did. Michigan? Overrated. No. They're not 14. Shea Patterson's good. Mm. They return nine guys on mm. defense, eight on offense. Mm. They finally have a quarterback. All I know, it's been a lot of hype since Jim Harbaugh got there, and none of the results have matched the hype. Oh, I get none that, but there's a lot of hype there because he wins the offseason every year. Ooh. How, Let about, me, how about when the how about when your division? How about that? Yeah, your third best team. You've been the third, fourth best team in your division since you got there. On, it's because he he puts himself up for those expectations, and I'm fine with it. That's true. Let me throw this. Let's play a hypothetical. Yes. Uh oh. Because this is what college football is all about. You hypothetical questions. Let's just say, let's say that LSU doesn't get off to a good start. Mm-hmm. They lose to Miami week one, which I genuinely believe that they probably will. So they lose to Miami week one, and they're not really competitive in that game. They're going to win week two. They've got Auburn week three. Okay. They're going to lose that game. Mm-hmm. So they start the season one and two. Mm-hmm. And then they think they've got La Tech after that. And then they've got Ole Miss. Then Florida, then Georgia. If Ed Ogeron, and they just can't get this thing together, and they decide to they do him wrong like they did Les Miles, would you not sign up for five years and go get Lane Kiffin from FAU. Oh my gosh. No. I'm, Is that not the best no, thing you've heard no, today? No, it's the worst thing ever. And I'll tell you why. And this is point of full disclosure. I am anything but Camp Kiffin. Oh. I am. What's the opposite of Camp Kiffin? That's me. I couldn't disagree more. Um, Here's the thing about Lane Kiffin. All right. And I've said this before. And I've, I've said it privately. This may be the first time I've actually said it publicly. Ooh. He's the classic example of a guy born on third and thought he hit a triple. <laughs> his, his, <laughs> he, he got to a position yes. based on his father. And yeah, but for the most part, though, here's the thing. All right, if, if you, some of us are fortunate to get certain things because of some connection. Yes. But when did he ever prove that he was worthy of that hookup. Okay, let's oh, not once. Yet, oh, not what you, once. What are you talking about? When has about? he done that? We're staying here for a second. Please once, bring because, it. So okay, 
So his dad, Monty Kiffin, legendary defensive coordinator, yes. gets him into coaching. How many coaches' kids do you see out there? A lot. You see a lot of coaches. How, I, how many of them are 25 and offensive coordinator at USC? Did it work? Okay. Steve Sarkeesian was also there, and you also had three of the best players of their generation in college football. Matt Leinart, Reggie Bush, even at Lindo White. Anybody could have ran that offense. Oh, really? So now you're the guy that's saying anybody could win with Nick Saban's talent. That is... It's, Incorrect. That's not quite what I said. I was talking about that particular team at USC. Yeah, it, wasn't, it was an all-timer. It was okay. all-time. All right. So then it's Kiffin's fault for getting hired at the Raiders as a head coach. That's Al Davis being Al Davis. Correct. No, no, no. I'm not I'm not blaming him for it. I'm saying that someone took a chance on him based on some other things, and he didn't live up to their expectations and for you, anyone. And if you look at where that was headed, he had started turning that thing around. Really? Not his fault really? they drafted Jamarcus Russell. Again, Al Davis. Really? Yeah. It was turning around. He was getting something out of okay. those guys. No, that, that, so that's, then, that's a bit of hyperbole there. Then there's Didn't the, they go to Tennessee? There's an infamous, the infamous overhead projector press conference, which yes. was the most awkward thing in sports. Then he goes to Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And he had a little bit of momentum going at Tennessee. And then the dream job a came up. A little bit up. of momentum at Tennessee. He was recruiting. I don't okay. know how, I don't know how fair he was. Everyone recruiting, recruits. But he was recruiting well at Tennessee. And then his dream job comes open at USC. Now, I get you. Lane Kiffin's reputation is failing up. But yes. the problem Lane Kiffin had, this is his only problem, I believe, in his stint at USC. First of all, they won. I forget what they closed that season out with Barkley and had a lot of momentum going into the next year. I think they were preseason number one. And they just had a little momentum stop at the beginning of the season. They just get off to a good start. And they got mm-hmm. fired after ASU beat him in Tempe. But his biggest problem at USC is he didn't understand that being a head coach in college, you have to shake hands, kiss babies, go to booster events, and play nice with How people. How do you not know that? How do you not know he's that? He's never had to do it. How, but he, it doesn't matter. He's been around it enough. His father's been in coaching enough. He not was college. But he was with Pete Carroll. And Pete Carroll did that in L.A. as better, as good as, as well as anyone ever. Because Pete he Carroll's a charismatic it. guy. I, but he saw it. He didn't have to do it, though. But he saw it. He knows that's part of the job. Anyone who gets a head coaching job or anyone who aspires to it knows or should know what the job requires. He's failed up his entire career. He goes to Alabama. He has a lot of success because of Nick Saban and the talent there. And then he messes that up. Well, he didn't mess that up. Oh, he totally messed it up. He won a couple of national championships, developed some good quarterbacks, Wanted to be a head coach again. What, what quarterbacks developed so well that they went to the NFL? Blake, well, that doesn't oh, matter. No, 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 no. Oh, it does. Not so really. If, you, if you're developing quarterbacks, then the, the development goes beyond where they were he just in school. He turned Blake Sims from a running back to a quarterback and Jake Coker. And they ran the ball. Don't say he developed him as a quarterback. That's he developed him as a guy who true. took the snap from under the center, oh, okay. handed off to his right, Hand off to his left, maybe second and four, he looked up and hit a tight end on a slant. The Come whole on. reason Nick Saban brought in Kiffin because he was like, you know what? I can't just run the ball anymore. I've got to be up tempo and evolve with college they, football. They weren't necessarily up tempo. They just threw it more than they had in the past. I'm telling you, what Dude. Kiffin's done at FAU, I'm, he's learned what he needs to do to be a head coach. If I look, I'll. I was hoping Malzahn would go to Arkansas so Auburn could have hired Lane All right, I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Please. Herm Edwards wins 10 games this year, and an NFL team buys him out, brings him to the NFL. Do you want Lane Kiffin coming to your alma mater? Let's go. Let's go. In some regards, I hope that I hope that actually happens. One, because it would be great for Herm to have a great year at ASU and then get back to the NFL let's, as a head coach and make a lot of money. On and, leaving ASU. And, then, and then you have the responsibility of Lane Kiffin going to your alma mater. I would hope by now. How old's Lane? He's in his 40s yet? I don't know. He's got to be 42. Dude, Lane now. is about Lane. He's always been about Lane, and that's why all these other things have okay. flamed out the way they've Stay been. Stay there. Give me one coach that is 43. One coach that isn't all about them. Herm That's Edwards. what college football... Herm Edwards. Herm Edwards isn't about him. He's about the kid. You're <laughs> See right. See what I'm saying? Which, by the way, you can See download the saying? Maddie and the Caddy podcast. Herm Edwards is our guest. But give me another coach. No, it's one, thing to, it's one thing to be ambitious. It's one thing to try to be the best coach in the country and have the most successful program. That's one thing. It's something else to be selfish. Lane Kiffin has always been selfish. He's been a little spoiled. 
a little spoiled. But think about it. He was anointed the next great mind. So there have been early a lot of people career. anointed certain things and not just been complete jerks about it. And that's what Lane Kiffin has been for so long. He didn't have any consideration for other people the way his actions played out. So it's going to be real hard for me to be Camp Lane Kiffin. You I play. saw it up close in person. I was when I was in LA when he was assistant coach for USC. I covered the Pac-12 when he came back as head coach. I saw it all. Not a fan. He wasn't. A, he wasn't a good people person. So you think he is now? I think that he's learned. Okay, you can learn to manipulate people into thinking you're a good people person. He's winning games at FAU by hanging a lot of points. But he's also someone's going to give him a shot. But he's also giving a shot to players that were kicked out of other teams for whatever reason. But they were talented. That's why he brought them down there. It ain't like he's trying to resurrect their career or resurrect their themselves as, as young adults. No, he's, using, he's trying to win. He's using them. You're about to say it. He's using them to get another opportunity to go to somewhere else and get a big paying job. That's what he's doing. And you want him to go to LSU. You want him to go to ASU when Herm Edwards gets another NFL job. That's what you want. Well, let's tap the brakes on the ASU thing. No, no, I'm just trying no to we got to make it personal. I'm, I'm, we got to make it enjoy, personal. I'm for trying you. to enjoy Herm here, but all I know is that Kiffin knows football. Nick Saban was impressed with him at Tennessee. He knows football, and he was so impressed with him after a couple of years, he kicked him out of Tuscaloosa. Yeah, because he wasn't paying attention to the job anymore. Because he was all about him and his new head coaching job, and that's fine. Is it though? No, other assistants for Saban didn't do that. They worked out fine, including the new head coach of Georgia. Kirby Smart didn't do that. Kirby Smart didn't make it all about him. You're right, but they're they're different. Every head coach is different, but inherently, every coach is about themselves and their program. You're telling me Mark Stoops somehow gets another job. You're not you're not excited about Lane Kiffin being hired as Kentucky's football coach. Absolutely, that'd not. be the biggest thing to happen to Kentucky football since Andre Woodson back in. And the it day. would be a bad move. I'd be great, and I would tell the president that personally. I would call the athletic director personally and tell him how I felt about it. Who you're Kentucky football? Mm -hmm. That'd be that would be such a good hire for you. It'd be a it'd be (laughs) no, nah, man, no. It would be a good hire to get attention for the program. That's not what necessarily I'm always about. I I want good people representing my alma mater and my state. So you're against second chances? No, 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 no. I think second chances have to be well earned and not just out of spite to. You know, throw shade at a coach that kicked you out of town, so you talk a bunch of trash about him on social media, <laughs> and then you want to get to a point where you can get to school, you can play him and beat him. That's different. That's vindictive. You I don't, don't want that. You don't like that he signs off every tweet with RP for rat poison? No, I don't Phenomenal. want that. No. That's just like next level trolling because he is a troll. Hey, whatever happens with FAU, all the fans down there, the alumni, good luck to you, but I'm a long way from being Camp Kiffin. Long way from that. Uh, coming up, Next, I mean, Coach Cal just killing it in Lexington. Yeah, there we go. It's going to be great. Uh, next <laughs> segment, we got ESPN Colts reporter Mike Wells joining us to talk a little about Andrew Luck. Hey, you need game tickets? Find your seats at Vivid Seats, official ticket partner of ESPN. Enter promo code ESPN at checkout and receive 10% off your order today. That is Vivid Seats. Michael Lee's Matt Berry coming back with more here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Hey, do you have frequent heartburn? Like the kind where you have antacid stash everywhere in case it pops up? You know what I mean. You keep some in your bag, your desk, your car, even your nightstand. You have those chalky tablets ready for whenever and wherever heartburn strikes. Well, listen up. There's an easier way to deal with your heartburn, Prilosec OTC. Just one pill a day will last a full 24 hours with zero heartburn. Kick your antacid habit. It's possible with Prilosec OTC. Use as director for 14 days to treat frequent heartburn, not for immediate relief. Ricky always wanted to play baseball in the majors. He was playing catch before he could walk, practically lived in the batting cages. He was behind home plate more than he was home. And one day, after all that hard work, he found himself walking into a major league baseball stadium. After buying a ticket at the front gate, a nosebleed seat obscured by a pole, but he was in there. No, Ricky never did play in the big leagues, but he did switch his car insurance to Geico, proud partner of major league baseball, which saved him a lot. So all in all, things were good. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. Michael Lee's Matt Berry in for Stephen A. here on a Tuesday. You can join the show at one eight 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 say ESPN. That's one eight 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 seven two nine three seven seven six. We actually have a couple callers on the line. We want to get to uh, momentarily. Some people have sort of heated up about our college football discussion. Um, also, some NFL stuff because we asked earlier. Um, talking about storylines and maybe most compelling stories here in 2018. 
and you asked the question, who is this year's Rams? And we got a couple candidates. Uh, somebody actually hit me up on Twitter, at Michael Leaves. They said the Niners. I think that's a pretty good one. Solid. Pretty good one. A lot of people excited about the quarterback situation there with Jimmy Garoppolo and some of the things they've done the last couple of years. Did you bring up Jacksonville as a team out of nowhere from last year? I did. They you were did. a team they out were, of yes. with yes. the uh, with the Rams. Yeah. Yes, they they were that team. So we need somebody that wasn't a team last year. You also hit up uh, Matt on Twitter as well at Matt Berry. But before we get to all that, we want to go out to Indianapolis and talk a little bit more about Andrew Luck. Uh, Mike Wells is our ESPN Colts reporter. Has been holding down that beat for a couple of years. I actually used to cover the Pacers uh, there in India as well. He joins us now here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Mike, what's up, man? How you doing? What's going on, Eves? You are just like Mr. Multiversal Superstar, man. You do a little of everything. Hey, you see my wife, right? <laughs> so yes. she, talking about out kicking that coverage there, but I'm not mad at you. Hey, man, handbags, shoes. I, somebody got to pay for that, boss. Like, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's why me and Matt Berry do double shifts, man. You seen his wife? You yeah. <laughs> Look at <laughs> Ashley Berry's Instagram and see what we're playing over before. You go in her closet, you'll get anxiety. Her closet is another bedroom. <laughs> that's, that's a true story. Oh, I'm not mad at you guys there. Hey, Mike, we appreciate you joining us, man. We were talking earlier about Andrew Luck and uh, even with uh, Adam Schefter earlier. And clearly what we saw last night, a little bit of rust here or there, but some of the throws he made was the Andrew Luck we've been accustomed to. But what we did not see were throws down the field, 20 yards and plus. From the people that you've talked to within the organization, maybe even Andrew Luck himself, is that all part of the process that they put in place for him to get him ready for that season opener? Yeah, that is, Michael. And, you know, Luck talked about it after the first preseason game in Seattle on August 9th. He said he was not at the comfort level as far as, you know, going deep down the field. He said he felt more comfortable with short and intermediate throws. So I asked him over the weekend if he was ready to take that next step. Can he make every every throw possible in a game? And he says, I am totally comfortable making those throws. But Frank Reich, the new head coach, he's keeping everything very, 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 very vanilla when it comes to what they're trying to do offensively. They don't want to show too much, and you can't forget, they were without left tackle Anthony Costanzo. He's the veteran of that offensive line. He's the one responsible for protecting Andrew Luck's blind side. He has yet to play in the preseason because of a hamstring, and their Pro Bowl receiver, T.Y. Hilton. He's been Luck's primary down-the-field target. They came into the league together in 2012, and Hilton is dealing with a shoulder injury. So they're going to keep it very, very simple. They don't want Luck to be in the pocket too long because the last thing you want, you're waiting 19 months to get your franchise quarterback back on the football field, and he gets injured in a preseason game. We've all seen the number of injuries that are taking place this preseason. They don't want anything to happen to Andrew Luck, so they're keeping it very basic when it comes to the play calling. Yeah, Mike, you bring that up with with Andrew Luck, and you don't want anyone getting injured in the preseason. What was it like when that Terrell Suggs sack happened where he reaches out, right arm, buries him into the ground, landed similarly to how he did when he got hurt? That couldn't have been a good situation. No, yeah, I'm sure there was a lot of nervousness inside that organization from owner Jim Mercy to general manager Chris Ballard. When you see Terrell Suggs, one of the premier pass rushers in the NFL, chasing down your franchise quarterback, and to Luck's surprise, he was happy that it happened. You know, he said going in, he wanted to get hit. He wanted to get hit again to see how how that felt against Seattle. Then he gets sacked by uh, Terrell Suggs. And he said he was fine because, like you said, he landed on that on his right side the same way he injured it in week three of the 2015 season. And not only did it, did it show that he could stand up physically from it, but I think from a mental aspect for Andrew Lutz, I think it was good for him because when you've been sacked 156 times in your career, you've missed 26 games over the past three seasons, um, you not only have to deal with the physical adversity, but also from the mental side where you're wondering where that pass rush is going to come from and can you handle getting hit over and over again. So I think this was just another step that it happened. You can tell Terrell Suggs picked up Andrew Luck off the field, and Andrew Luck, he's one of those guys, he'll take the hit and he'll keep on going. Now it's a matter of can he sustain it over a course of a 16-game season. ESPN Colts reporter Mike Wells joining us here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. ESPN Radio presented by Progressive Insurance, cars, homes, boats, motorcycles, RVs, and more at Progressive.com. So with all that being said, and considering the length of time he's been out, as far as the organization is concerned, Mike, what is the expectation for this 2018 season for the Colts? 
The thing is, I'm not sure the Colts are going to be a very good football team. I mean, they have $51 million in salary cap space, but general manager Chris Ballard is adamant, adamant in trying to build this thing to the roster, do the draft. They drafted 11 players last, last spring. He does not want to take any shortcuts. They're going to handle taking their lumps. But I will say this, if Andrew Luck can regain his form, and like you said, it's a big if right now because nobody knows what's going to happen. They have a chance. Um, but I, when you look at the AFC South, Jacksonville is the best team out there. And if, you know, Deshaun Watson gets going again uh, after tearing his ACL with that defense, they're probably the top two teams in the AFC South. But it's a matter of luck getting out there and making average players even better. But nobody knows that that's going to happen. Do I believe they're going to be a playoff team? No, I don't believe that. But they should be able to build on the four wins they had last year without Andrew Luck. Let's play this game, Mike Wells, since you cover the AFC South by virtue of the, the Indianapolis Colts, who has a better comeback season, Andrew Luck or Deshaun Watson? Man, I watched Andrew Luck his first his first three years, and even two years ago when he had the shoulder injury and he had a, a career high in completion percentage despite not practicing every week. I'm going to go with Andrew Luck. I'm going to go with Luck in this area because I think people are doubting that Andrew Luck can be the quarterback that he was before, and he is on a mission. He's happy. And so I'm going to go with him, and he has more experience. And I, no offense to Deshaun Watson, who knows what it takes to come back from ACL injury, but I'm going to go with the veteran in this situation and Luck. All right. That's that's big talk right there. I think Deshaun Watson's so I, good. I do too. And I, that's not taking anything away from Andrew Luck. No. I'm just, I'm just, I've been a huge fan of Deshaun Watson for quite some time, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out for him. Mike Wells. Oh, it's going to be fun. Yeah, it'll it'll be definitely fun. be fun, fellas. All right. Hey, man, appreciate the time. Look forward to talking to you throughout the season. All right. All right, guys. Take care. All right, Mike Wells, ESPN Colts reporter, joining us here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Be sure to check out all of Mike's coverage on ESPN.com. Let's go to the phone lines because we have someone actually from Indianapolis. His name is Anthony. He wants to chime in about Luck and RG3, which seems a bit of a – I don't know what – I'm not going to use that word. Anthony, you tell me what you want to talk about. I love it. It's a recap of last night. So, pretty much, uh, first of all, I've always been an Andrew Luck fan. I played against Andrew Luck in college. Okay. Uh, just, you know, and I also played against uh, a good friend of mine, Ryan Kerrigan, also in college. But, see, I think that the issue is what I thought, what I saw last night is that we need to start looking at, we need to really start looking at the talent in our running backs because without, without, Knowing who is our best running back on our on you know on our roster, Andrew Luck is going to you know constantly get hit. I don't care how good of an offensive line you have, if you don't if you can't sell that 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 you know that pitch or or that play action to to keep the defense on their toes, your quarterback, the franchise quarterback, is going to constantly get hit and it's going to constantly keep making mistakes. Now I do agree that Andrew Luck has been, you know. Two years ago, when he got injured, he, he you know he came back and you know he did a great job. He was tremendous when he came back from his injury while he was injured. But what I want to see from this new head coach that we have for the coach is something that I didn't get to see last night, and and that was what type of talent do we have in the running game? Who who can who can we define to be our number one and number two backs? Well, Anthony, here's the deal, though. A- one, Anthony, let me cut you off there, and I appreciate the call. All of that is going to be predicated on Andrew Luck, though, that's it. because he is such a huge focal point of that offense in Indianapolis, and has been since he got there. Everything works off of him. It's not the other way around. Like it's great to have good running backs, clearly, but if you have a tremendous quarterback, all the other stuff falls in line in line behind that, not the other way around. It's quarterback league. It's a quarterback league. Like, the running back is not going to make Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck more likely is going to make the running back. Well, and there's examples where it can go the other way. I know Ezekiel But not for a player El- like Andrew Luck, though. No. Or for Tom Brady. Like, no, like Ezekiel Elliott right. was very much the reason Dak had such Correct. a good year. I mean, that, He's a rookie. That's different. That, right? was, that was tailor-made for him. But, yeah, typically you can, if you've got a dominant franchise quarterback, you use the Patriots as, as an example. Yeah. They use five running backs a year. Yes. They made Rex Burkhead relevant. I mean, how many running backs has Aaron Rodgers had since he's been there, right? Quite a few. That's what I'm saying. So if you have a franchise quarterback, the running backs fall in line behind them, not the other way around. Uh, we want to get to some of your phone calls here before we close out, going up to the top of the hour here. Get that lane train On going. ESPN Radio and ESPN2, of course, the ESPN app. Michael E's Matt Berry in for Stephen A. Smith. So if you're on the line, please stay 
on the line. We're going to get to you right after this. Uh, it's been a long off season without football, but FanDuel has spent it getting into the best shape of their lives. That means this. FanDuel is ready for more. More ways to play. More ways to challenge your friends. And most importantly, more ways to win. And FanDuel also has new options for playing daily fantasy with your friends because the only thing better than winning cash is winning your friends cash. They even have preseason fantasy contests running up to week one of the NFL. Right now, you can get a $20 bonus when you make your first deposit on FanDuel. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash Stephen A. Age and straight restrictions apply. More of the Stephen A. Smith Show coming up next. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! We are back here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Michael Lee's along with Matt Berry. Uh, had fun today. Appreciate yeah. the, you guys hanging out with us on the phone lines. We're going to get to you in just a moment. 1-88-SAY-ESPN. That's 1-88-729-3776. You can surprise a friend or loved one today with a bouquet from 1-800-Flowers.com. When you order a dozen multicolored roses for only twenty nine ninety nine, you get another dozen absolutely free. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. Of course, ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Home Insurance. Getting a quote is easier than ever. So, Matt, you got people all riled up about Lane Kiffin earlier. Um, I may have helped, um, but we also got people hyped about the NFL season and what maybe the big storyline is. Where do you want to start? I'm going to leave this up to you because I know where you're going. So go ahead and start with the Kiffin. Yeah, because yes, basically the argument earlier was that I think the lane train is something another school should hop on immediately. Another school immediately. After this season, after FAU wins 10 more games. And you think it's absurd. So I want to hear from Luke in Florida Uh-oh. what he thinks about this might be Lane. Actually. One Lane Kiffin. Hello, Luke. Hey, how we doing today, boys? All right, man. So uh, first thing I got to say is I love the show first and foremost. But Lane Kiffin, let's talk about this for one second. What he's doing with this FAU program this year is going to be phenomenal. You know, they have two questionable games this year. They play Oklahoma and UCF, both ranked teams. UCF should be ranked way higher than where they are right now. But I heard you guys talking about Lane Kiffin being all about himself. He's not, though. The kids that he's brought down here, he's giving kids second chances who have been kicked out of programs, who haven't had their chances. He's bringing them down here to showcase that talent, to make them get somewhere, go somewhere better, develop them. And I think Luke, he's bringing those kids down there put, because they can help him win. Luke, I agree. Story Come of on. redemption. Come on now. The story of I redemption. Think he's doing it all for the kids. It's I agree. He's kids. definitely not doing it all for the kids. Luke, you're right. When has he done anything all for the kids? Show me an example of no. him doing anything all for the kids. The minute he walked away from Saban was probably the best thing he could have done from his he career. He didn't walk away from Saban. He got kicked away from Saban. He was shown the door. He was told to leave eh, campus. Kind of he was told yeah, to that's, leave that's, prior to the national championship game. He's like, you got to go. Yeah, because he had See, another that's, job. That's questionable. Correct. But if you think about it, Kirby you think Smith about it, right? Job. We're he talking stayed. about quarterbacks. The quarterbacks there, right? A.J. McCarron, number one example. Been in the NFL nah, for years. He hasn't had his when, chance. He went to Buffalo. No, that was before that. But look, all right, so so he look, did look. So Amari, he did turn Amari Cooper like Amari Cooper with Blake Sims at quarterback, and then won the Belitnikoff, which yes. wasn't easy to do. Yes. Appreciate the call, Luke, and you're right about Lane Kiffin. Uh, no, he's not. He's 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 <laughs> trying to have that rose colored glasses about a dude who's never showed that in in his career. Robert, South Carolina, your thoughts on Lane Kiffin? <laughs> turn down your radio. Yeah, he hit it on the head earlier. Uh, Lane Kiffin has been the biggest excuse coach that's there been in a long time. Hey, Rob, you got to turn your radio down, buddy. We're going to do this. You got to turn, turn it down. Yeah, he, right, he's been the biggest. He's been the biggest excuse coach for a long time. That you we know, every agree. Time he's absolutely right. It's always something else. For and what? It's Give always me. something. Thank you, Robert. When you, when you were going through all the other things earlier, you were giving up all these excuses. It was. Um, Al Davis's fault. It was Nick Saban's fault. It was the alumni in Knoxville. It was all the other people's fault. I didn't say that. First of all, all I said was Al Davis is the one who hired him. Mm -hmm. You're not going to turn down the job if you're Lane Kiffin at 32 years old. He was trying to hit. You gave him an excuse for leaving Knoxville because it was his dream job to go to USC after one year. Where's the commitment? You're trying to teach kids about commitment. There's no commitment. He was an offensive coordinator in LA. That's his dream. It was his dream job. There was no debate on that. It's not like he tried to sell people that Stanford was his dream job. (laughs) I mean, it's like it was USC. Um, I wish we could get to some of these other calls, especially because there's a guy named Michael from Kentucky. So I'm a little. 
I'm a little disappointed we didn't get to that call. But I understand. And I also understand that Lane Kiffin is about Lane Kiffin. And that's why everything he tweets, everything he puts out there, it's all self-serving. And, no, I don't want him at my school. All due respect. Give me give me this year's Browns or this year's uh, Rams real quick. <sighs> I hate to say this. All right. I'm actually going to go with the Niners. I, I kind of like that pick. You like the Niners? I do. But they're a tough division because they've got to play the Rams twice. So, I don't know. You? 